Hello again. I'm Adam Elwanger, Associate Professor of English at University of Houston downtown, um, and continuing the series of lectures on rhetorical theory. Today I wanted to discuss Plato's Phaedrus. Um, and in an earlier video entitled The Origins of Greek Rhetoric, I talked a little bit about who Plato was and the context in which he was writing. Today we'll talk about how his text Phaedrus has uh, things to say about that context and about Greek society at large. Um, so first let's talk about this text itself. Like all of Plato's writing, it's a dialogic text, a dialogue. Um, there's also some letters that he wrote, but for the most part where he writes dialectical encounters. Um, encounters where we use the dialectical method to answer some pertinent question to ethics or philosophy. Um, so, interesting features about this text. It's kind of an unusual one for Plato. Uh, for one, the dialogue takes place outside the city, which is unusual. Um, Socrates generally likes to be in the city, where the action is, where he says he can learn from people, um, not in the countryside. Uh, and most of this dialogue takes place under a plane tree by a little stream, right? It's a very idyllic setting. Um, and it's one that complements uh, the topic of love, which is used as a vehicle in this text to discuss uh, rhetoric and persuasion. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Another feature of this text is that there's only two um, participants in the dialogue, Socrates and Phaedrus, um, a younger student and an object of, uh, of Socrates' sort of um, uh, love interest. Um, so, uh, that's unusual too. So there's an, uh, an unusual intimacy to this text. Uh, it's about love. It happens in this idyllic, natural setting. Um, and it's just one-on-one, -on -one, right? A one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, so let's get into the meat of the text. Uh, what happens is Socrates encounters Phaedrus who has spent the afternoon, or rather the morning, with Lysias, a famous um, Greek speaker. And Phaedrus ha is quite impressed and enamored by a particular uh, speech that Lysias delivered. Um, and Plato is aware um, that, he's, that Phaedrus has been uh, listening to this, and he suspects that he's heard the speech many times and perhaps even has a copy with him um, of the speech. And it turns out that he does. And the two agree to go outside the city so that Phaedrus can, can practice the speech on, on, uh, on Socrates. Um, and so they go to do this, right? And they find this intimate setting that's away in the grasses near the stream to sit down. And the topic of the speech that Lysias gave is love. And the claim of the speech, the speech that Phaedrus had, um, had uh, been enamored by, was that um, it's better to give favors to the non-lover than to the lover, right? This is kind of um, characteristic of sophist um, uh, rhetoric of display that we talked about in the last video that you watched. Um, in other words, Lysias takes what seems to be um, an unusual argument that contradicts what most people would accept, and he tries to make a very good case for the unusual position. That is, that the person you should engage in um, intimacy with is not someone who loves you, but rather someone who doesn't. Um, and in this way, this is one of the ways that the sophists would demonstrate their mastery of speech, that they could take an, un un an unlikely claim like that and persuade you, um, change your mind on it. 
Uh, and so um, they, Socrates convinces Lysias to give the speech. Um, and the speech is not particularly great. Um, it, the speech of Lysias argues that the non-lover is pure to lover basically because the lover is selfish and, and basically wants the, you know, is jealous of the presence of the beloved, um, tries to keep the beloved person away from other friends, monopolizes their time, um, and that kind of thing. Whereas Lysias basically argues that the non-lover is frank about um, his desires, right, and isn't particularly interested in the rest of your life, right? It's just looking for momentary gratification, and you can remain friends and just go your separate ways after the gratification is achieved. Um, so we'll get to the point... Um, The point where after Phaedrus has finished the speech by Lysias. And Phaedrus asks, this is on page 142, if you're following along in the rhetorical tradition. By the way, if there's any other rhetoricians watching this, this is a great anthology, but somebody needs to put together another one. Um, because there should be a competing one. Uh, and this is really the only rhetoric, good rhetoric anthology of sort of greatest hits that's on the market. Um, but anyways, on 142, uh, it says, What do you think of the discourse, Socrates? Is it not wonderful, especially in its diction? In other words, especially in the way that it's written? Socrates says, More than that, it is miraculous, my friend. I am quite overcome by it. And this is due to you, Phaedrus. Because as I looked at you, I saw that you were delighted by the speech as you read. So thinking that you know more than I about such matters, I followed in your train and joined you in the divine frenzy. Um, this is interesting for a few reasons. Uh, how is Socrates overcome by the speech? Not by what it says, but by watching and listening to Phaedrus give the speech. Now, Socrates calls this, a, he says he's in a divine frenzy. Um, earlier in the earlier video I referred to, I talk about the way that sophistic rhetoric seeks to achieve a kind of enchanting of the audience. And Socrates here admits that he's enchanted. Um, but there are ca cautionary signs here in his response. Um, one, remember, Phaedrus praises it for its diction. In other words, he thinks that it's well written. But something can be well written and have nothing interesting to say. Um, and I think that this is, this is what, um, what Socrates is getting to in a moment. He's, he's saying, look, it was great, yeah, it was enchanting. But the question is, is there any truth to it, right? And so early on in dialogue, this question between, this tension between episteme and pistis, that is knowledge and belief, or doxa, public opinion is established. In other words, Plato, historically, as a philosopher, as a dialectician, is interested in getting to truth and knowledge, right? But he's concerned that Lysias' speech is just trying to manipulate people's beliefs. And so he continues right after that. Phaedrus says, don't jest, Socrates, but in the name of Zeus, the god of friendship, tell me truly, do you think any of the other Greeks could speak better and more copiously than, on, than this on the same subject? Again, he's not asking if anybody can state better truth. He's asking if anybody could speak better or more copiously, more abundantly than that. He's concerned, that is, both Phaedrus and Lysias with style rather than substance. And sort of a rhetoric of style of display is associated in Plato's writings with pistis, simple belief that falls short of truth and knowledge. Okay, so Socrates continues, What? Are you and I to praise the discourse? 
because the author has said what he ought, and not merely because all the expressions are clear and well-rounded and finely tuned? For if that is expected, I must grant it for your sake, since because of my stupidity I didn't notice it. I was attending only to the rhetorical manner, and I thought even Lysias himself would not think that satisfactory. It seemed to me, Phaedrus, unless you disagree, that he said the same thing two or three times, as if he did not find it easy to say many things about one subject, or perhaps he did not care about such a detail, and he appeared to be in youthful fashion to be exhibiting his ability to say the same thing in two different ways, and in both ways excellent, excellently. So in other words, uh, Plato, or rather Socrates, criticizes Lysias on the grounds that his speech just repeats itself. And if you read the speech carefully, I think you would agree. Basically, the, the whole speech can be summed up in that the lover is self-interested and places burdens on uh, his partner. Um, and the non-lover doesn't do that, right? Uh, and so, Socrates, th or Socrates thinks that it's an inferior speech. That on the rhetorical level of display, of diction, um, or in the quality of the style, it's excellent. But there's really nothing there. Uh, and he, he goes on to say, um, Why, my dear friend, I feel that my own bosom is full. He's again talking about how enchanted he is, nonetheless that I could make another speech, different from this and quite as good. Now I'm conscious of my own ignorance, and I know very well that I have never invented these things myself. So the only alternative is that I have been filled through the ears, like a pitcher, from the wellsprings of someone else. But again, because of my stupidity, I've forgotten how and from whom I heard it. In other words, <coughs> Socrates is saying, that this rhetoric has influenced him, right? That on some level it's changed him, right? And he feels as if he could even give a speech as good while he's in this entranced state. Um, and later he praises uh, invention, right? As one of the five canons of rhetoric. He says, um, no such arguments must be allowed and excused. And in these, the arrangement, not the invention, is to be praised. But in the case of arguments which are not inevitable and are hard to discover, the invention deserves praise as well as the arrangement. And so again, he says, yeah, the speech is put together well. I mean, it's nicely arranged, you know, um, even though it says the same thing a few times. And he says that it doesn't really get to any uh, arguments that are difficult to come up with. And that is the job of invention, uh, that it generates, it invents knowledge. That's what he's after. Um, and so uh, we have to comment here on the intimacy between um, Socrates and Phaedrus. There's a flirtation that goes on throughout the text uh, and that plays into the theme of love here. Um, so let's unpack that. Right? <clears throat> this theme of love and its effects is a proxy discussion of rhetoric and its effects, okay? So as they talk about how a lover is affected or changed, right, they're also talking about how the audience of rhetoric can be affected by speech and change. And indeed, both are happening in the, in the context of the dialogue that we see. For example, uh, the two men are sort of flirting with one another and enchanted by one another's presence, right? Um, but meanwhile, as they offer these speeches on love, they become enchanted by the rhetoric. Um, and uh, needless to say, Socrates is very skeptical of this kind of enchantment, right? Um, because it moves us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, which is kind of a characteristic of the, the rhetoric of empowerment that the sophists pursue. is just getting what you want, convincing other people to say or do or believe things because it aligns with your own objectives, right? Um, and this kind of enchanting that both of these can affect, right, can lead people down roads that they wouldn't otherwise go down. Um, 
And so there's this um, resistance in Socrates that we see to go further down this road of enchantment because he's concerned about where that leads. Later on, he discusses the nature of the human being and the soul. And he says that the soul is like a charioteer with being drawn by two horses. So here's the horses. There's two horses, and one is a good and beautiful horse, right? In other words, it responds very well to the driver. Um, it's strong, and it remains calm. It responds to orders. And then there's this other horse, a bad horse, an ugly horse, a weak horse, and a wild horse who's hard to control, right? And so the human soul is made up of these two things, right? The good horse, which he calls self-restraint, and the bad horse, which he calls excess. And needless to say, uh, you know, uh, the, the goal is to have this good horse win out in pulling the charioteer. Uh, but it doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes the, the bad horse, excess, wins. And when that happens, we're drawn further from the ideal, further from the good, and further from the truth. And so, both of these, love and rhetoric, get associated in different ways with the bad horse by Socrates. Um, that love can lead us into excessive behavior. The drive for self-gratification or for physical pleasure can lead you to behave in ways that might not live up to your own ethical standards or those of others, right? Or you might rush into things. And that's a kind of, um, you know, entrancing or hypnosis, right? Uh, and rhetoric is the same. It can lead us to excess, right? Because we can, we can in this uh, activity of rhetoric, we can kind of become drunk on our own power and recognize that if we can just convince people to believe certain things, then we can get what we want a lot of the time. And this comes back to another... Uh, Another truth about rhetoric, which is a hard truth, and that's that oftentimes the truth doesn't matter as much as what people believe to be true. In other words, something can be true, but nobody believes it to be true, and so it's not a very powerful truth. Conversely, something that people believe to be true can be very powerful, even if it's not true. Um, and I think that this is what rhetoric is in the big business of. Rhetoric is in the business of making the weaker part the stronger through these rhetorical techniques. And so it drives us to excess. Um, and so because Socrates is very interested in being driven by the good horse and self-restraint, he's very skeptical of the power of both of these things. Again, we see an example of the, trying to take the weaker part of the argument and make it stronger in the speech from Lysias, where he takes this odd argument that the one you should sort of engage in intimate relationships with is the one who doesn't love you. Um, so, uh, again, he sees that we're just uh, like inverting common beliefs, right? Just for the, the simple pleasure of persuading people um, and knowing that we can do it. Okay, so in, uh, I'm going to break this video here and then put up the part two where we discuss how these themes play out as the dialogue moves along. As usual, if you have any questions for me or um, comments, post them in the comment section on the video. Talk to you more in a minute.